Welcome, everyone, to another episode of As the Motor Turns, a brushless story of high intrigue, low power, and limitless speed where polarity drives us apart and into the arms of another. Wait, wasn't this show canceled? Like, what? Oh, that's As the World... Oh... So maybe you aren't trapped in a motor control soap opera like some of us. But maybe you could use a little brushless motor control refresher. Well, folks, you have come to the right place. And I promise there will be absolutely no overacting or villains in eye patches. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Yes, there has been a virtual explosion of brushless motors these days. And if we're going to talk about motors, we need to talk about controlling them. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Tom Wolf from Nexperia and I are talking about MOSFETs for motor control, the most important MOSFET requirements, and what you need to consider when choosing a MOSFET for your next brushless motor design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about MOSFETs for motor control from Nexperia. Hi, Tom. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, hello, Amelia. It's really nice to be here. Okay, so Tom, brushed and brushless motors are everywhere. And you're going to tell me how to select the right MOSFET. But let's start from the beginning. Where am I going to find these motors? Brushless DC motors are found everywhere today. Motors in general, but brushless DC motors is where the real growth is occurring. And here's just some of the examples. You're going to find them in electric bicycles, in cordless vacuum cleaners, drones, of course, and in all those, the quadcopters, battery-powered tools. So they're really showing up every place. It's literally an explosion of brushless DC motor applications. And that's why it's so interesting to learn about how do you actually drive these things. Sure. Okay. Let's take a look at these motors. Well, let's start with the old way of doing it, the brushed DC motor. These have been around for, man, a couple hundred years now. And here's a diagram of one. As you can see, fundamentally, it's two magnets that are fighting against each other. The permanent magnet is on the outside of it in the stator and the diagram. And then the rotor is the electromagnet, where you can change the polarity of each one of the coils, north or south. And of course, then I can have it either attracted to the outside of the magnet or repelled from it. Now, the way that you control how the rotor, how these electromagnets are changed in polarity, is by the commutator. The commutator is a little set of metal contacts around the end of the axle, the spindle itself, and the brushes move from one contact to another, making the coils either north-south poles or south-north poles. So as the motor turns, the contacts turn, and then each one of the motor coils changes polarity as it rotates around. By comparison, though, a brushless DC motor is inside out. The permanent magnet is on the inside. It's the part that spins. The electromagnetic coil is now on the outside of it. Now, what this means is you've got a lot of efficiency and way more control. First, the commutator isn't fixed. You don't have to have it always turning on the same coil at the same time with the same dwell in advance of the event. You can control it any time that you want. Also, you moved all the electric parts, the wire outside, so I can now spin that magnet much faster. So I can turn this much faster. I have more control over it. So it's the same basic concept. Magnets repel or attract to each other. But instead of having the electromagnet on the inside, I've moved to the outside, and now I have way more control. Instead of being a mechanically controlled motor, it is now an electronically controlled motor. And that's what makes all the difference. So here's the basic principles of it. And like I said, if you know anything about motors, you know that the little armature turns inside, the rotor turns, because the north or south poles of that magnet are attracted or repelled to the magnets on the outside. So here it is. In this case, the electromagnet is on the outside of it and the magnets on the inside. When you want it to turn, you move the north pole around the ring and the magnetic core inside turns in the same place. Because this is electronic though, you can determine how far in advance you want it to be. You can turn the coils on way in advance to get a weak pull and slowly pull the motor around, or you can track it closely. And of course you can reverse it as well too very easily. So you have a tremendous amount of control over what you can do with that motor. Very small, very efficient. And the best part is they're infinitely adjustable. It's no longer mechanical. It's in your software that determines how that motor is going to operate. Okay, so that's the mechanics of the motor. What about the electrical piece? 
Well, of course, we have to get into the electronic part now. So we've got the mechanics of it, and here's the diagram on the left of what the coils would look like around the outside of that permanent magnet that spins inside. Now, what's neat is for all these coils that are inside, you've only got three wires that go into this motor, and these are shown on the right side. They're called L1, L2, and L3, and this happens to be what's called an internal Y connection. There are other ways of doing it, but this is just the most common. What's nice, though, is that by determining what voltage you put on the combination of L1, 2, or 3 determines what the polarity of the magnets on the outside of that coil are. So simply by putting current through two of them in one direction, it automatically sets one set of coils through another set. So by alternating the way that I put the electricity through contacts L1, 2, and 3, I can move the electromagnetic field around the outside of the motor, and the permanent magnet inside, of course, follows that. So it makes it very simple and relatively straightforward. Three wires, and I have all this control of the motor. So, Tom, can we take a look at the circuit itself? Of course. Now, look at the circuit itself here. And the key thing you'll notice on the right is there's the magnetic coils of the motor. In the middle are six MOSFETs. And then on the left is the software stuff. Now, we only want to really focus on the MOSFET itself because that's the interface between your software, how clever you are in driving the motor, and the mechanical motor itself. It's these six MOSFETs that do all the work. They take that small level signal from your micro and drive it up to tens or hundreds or even more amps to actually spin the motor itself. So it's the characteristics of those six MOSFETs that is really critical in what really makes brushless DC motors possible today. So, Tom, in these applications, what do my MOSFETs need to do? The requirements of the MOSFET are pretty straightforward. Now, what we want to look at is how they're common as opposed to how they're different from each other. So in this case, the things that the power MOSFET needs to do. First, it's going to be connected to the motor windings all the time. Now, what this means is that, remember, when a motor turns, it consumes electricity but it also is a generator as well too. So when you turn off the supply to the motor, it keeps spinning, it has mechanical momentum, and it actually generates electricity back. So your power MOSFET needs to be able to tolerate that voltage coming back from the motor into it. That's something called an avalanche condition, where I'm actually putting more voltage into the part than it is typically driving out. I've got it into a reverse mode in particular. So your part needs to be capable of operating in an avalanche mode. The second thing is, is that you don't just turn these coils on all the time was you want to bring the motor up to speed, you use something called pulse width modulation control, where you're basically turning the MOSFET off and on really fast for each coil so that the electricity comes on slowly and turns off, not full on or full off. I'm constantly turning it off and on in this nice, slow, smooth pattern to get smooth operation for it. So that means this pulse width modulation is probably occurring at, say, eh, 10 to 20 kilohertz. It can be faster. Power supplies run at megahertz sometimes. But 10 to 20 kilohertz means that your MOSFET needs to be able to switch off and on that fast without creating noise to be able to give you full control of the motor itself. Now, the next thing you need is the voltage of the MOSFET has to be matched to the requirement of the motor. Since we're talking about battery-powered applications in particular, we're almost always driving them with a lithium polymer or lithium ion cells. You talk about the number of cells, for example, a five cell application is most common. That's an 18 volt battery. When you buy an 18 volt tool, it probably has five cells inside but it means that the battery actually can operate from 15 to 21 volts, depending if it is discharged or fully charged. In that case, then, you need something that has obviously more tolerance than just the maximum of the 21 volts, a 30 volt MOSFET would be very common. You want extra margin, you might put a 40 volt MOSFET on it. So you look at the application, how many batteries you have, and you have to make sure that the MOSFET can tolerate the voltage, the maximum voltage that that battery is going to put out. The next thing is something called the low RDS on. RDS on is the resistance from the drain to the source when the part is on. It's right there in the name. And that is the amount of resistance that the MOSFET creates. The more resistance it has, the more of your electricity it's going to burn off in the form of heat. So the MOSFET's going to get heat. Ideally, you want zero ohms, RDS on, but you can't have that. The goal is to get them as low as possible. The best MOSFETs today are less than one milliohm. Not one ohm, one milliohm. So sometimes as low as one half of one milliohm is the type of RDS on you want. 
lower RDS on means the more current I can put through the motor itself, which is the next specification. How much current does your application need? In particular, in its worst case application, what's called the stall condition. When you're using a power drill and you're drilling into a piece of wood and you hit a big knot in it and it locks up all of a sudden, it may consume several hundred amps. Your MOSFET must be able to tolerate that for long enough until usually your software says something's wrong, turn it off. But there is that amount of time, milliseconds to seconds, where your MOSFET must tolerate that 100, 200 amps without damaging itself. And then the final thing that you really need in brushless DC motor control is something called soft switching. This is the ability of the MOSFET to turn off and on slowly, because if I turn it on real fast, it creates noise, radio frequency noise, which would interfere with radio communications and cell phones and things like that. So in a lot of applications, you wanna make sure you have soft switching so that this doesn't create a lot of noise. And by the way, you might fail an FCC certification if you have too much noise on it. Okay, so if I'm looking at the data sheet, what do I really need to be checking out for there? What's really nice is that the data sheet tells you everything that you need to know to fit all the needs of that particular brush to CC motor application. So the first thing you'll find in the data sheet is the VDS, which is the breakdown voltage of the device. This is the voltage that you can operate on. So again, if you've got 20 volt batteries, 18 volt nominal, 21 volt maximum, you probably want a 30 volt MOSFET. You certainly don't want it less than that. You may want it more if you've got spikes or higher amount on it, but it gives you an order of magnitude of what voltage you need to operate your particular battery motor combination. The next thing is the ID max. That's the maximum current for the part. That tells you how much power you can flow through the device without exceeding its thermal capabilities. So fault conditions like a locked rotor, that's where you're gonna get the high power and you wanna make sure that your MOSFET that has enough power capability that it doesn't damage itself in the extreme situations. These are all going to change based on what the application is. A stall condition of a drill may be different than the startup current required for an electric motor or for a drone. So look at your particular application, understand how much current it will have in its worst case and make sure the MOSFET is rated for that. The next one, which is actually really the most important, putting current through a MOSFET is not the trick. Getting the heat out of the MOSFET is the trick when you're putting a lot of current through it. So the thermal performance of the device is really critical. It's great if you get 200 amps, how long can it do that? That is the thermal solution, which is really involved in the packaging and the way the part is built. And that's what really makes MOSFETs differ from each other, how you do that. So what you're looking for is a low thermal resistance R theta, which is the resistance from the chip inside the part to the outside of the package itself. The lower that number is, the faster the heat can get out of the part to the outside world where you can dissipate it without causing problems. The next one is the higher junction temperature max, TJ max. How hot can that piece of silicon get before it melts in the first place? In other words, if your part is going to fail at 100 degrees C, you have to make sure that all that heat can get out. But if your part can operate to 150 C, 175 degrees C, that simplifies your thermal solution. The part is not as delicate inside. For managing temperature, the other thing too is to manage the system efficiency. Just because you can put the maximum amount of heat out, you might not want to. Maybe you don't want the uh, handle of your power drill to get so hot that you drop it. So you want to have a low RDS on and a good thermal performance so you can get that heat out and make the tool or the appliance or the vacuum cleaner comfortable for a human being to hold while they're operating it. Moving on then, the next thing is the gate drive. The gate drive is the amount of voltage it requires to turn the MOSFET off or on. Now you can pick a low voltage, which would be a logic level, four and a half volts, or a standard level, which is 10 volts. Now there's reasons to pick each one of those. Four and a half volts allows you to run lower and lower operation. As your battery discharges, you can still turn it off and on and get all that juice out of the battery. However, you might get false noise out of it because it's a lower threshold. The part might turn on accidentally. So for some applications, you might want to have a higher voltage on it, which means I have to deliberately give it a signal to say, yes, I want you to be on. So it's the difference. It's really your application which is going to determine which one of those you want. The next one is the safe operating area. The safe operating area tells you what happens in between when the MOSFET turns on and when it turns off or off and on. Ideally, a MOSFET would switch instantly on and instantly off, but that's not the real world. In the real world, there's a linear mode where the part is switching from on to off and going through this phase. MOSFETs don't like operating in that linear mode. 
SOA tells you specifically in the data sheet how long you can stay at so much current in that linear mode. How long can I stay there for 100 amps before the part exceeds its thermal solution? So depending on how fast your drive circuit is turning the MOSFET off and on, or your particular application determines how wide, how big that SOA is, and then you want to pick a MOSFET which has that good of an SOA so it can live in that linear mode, in that vague area between off and on, and survive that. And then the last one is the size. We'd love to have these things as small as possible, but the size is directly related to the amount of current I can put through it and the amount of heat that I can get out of the device as well, too. Common footprints would be like a 5 by 6 millimeter, made by a number of different people. 5 by 6 millimeter footprint. There's smaller ones, 3 by 3s, which can do power. There's new standards emerging, which are 8 by 8 millimeters and bigger. Depending on the package size, the bigger the package can handle more current, but then it has to fit in your application as well, too. So so look for those standard different sizes of packages that gives you many choices in the marketplace, but it also allows you to adjust your circuit for the amount of power and the amount of thermal energy that that device needs to be able to supply. The next one is the avalanche rating. We talked about this briefly. Avalanche rating is the instance where the voltage coming back from the motor, from the drive circuit, exceeds the voltage of the MOSFET itself. In other words, it's driving it backwards in reverse. This is called an avalanche condition, and your part must be able to tolerate that. Otherwise, when the motor goes into free will, when you're coasting down a big hill in your electric bicycle, and that motor becomes a generator, that voltage is going to try to go back through the MOSFET, and you need to have a part which can tolerate tolerate that avalanche condition. And then finally, spike control, which we talked about as well too. This is the noise which is created when the MOSFET switches off and on. It's creating electric radiated noise, which could interfere with radios or other devices around it. And in some places, there are very strict regulations on how much noise you can create. So you want to make sure that your device has the right spike control, that it doesn't create too much noise while it's doing its job of being a MOSFET. Okay, that's really helpful. Now, Tom, can you tell me a little bit about these specific part numbers? So here's some specific part numbers. And in this case, the part number actually tells you a lot of what you need to know from the data sheet. You can see the part number here in the middle, like the PSMN0R7-25YLD. What that's telling you, the fourth digit, the N tells you this is an N-channel MOSFET. We didn't talk about that much, but there's N and P-channel devices for different applications. This tells you this is an N-channel device. The 0R7 tells you that this part is 0.7 milliohms of a device. So the RDS on is right in the part number. The 25 tells me the maximum voltage for the part, so it can run up to 25 volts. And then the YLD includes the information on the package itself. So just by looking at the part number, I can say, what's the voltage, what's the current, what's the RDS on, and what's the package? And if it looks right, then you can go into the data sheet and learn more. So because we're talking about battery-powered applications, on the left side, we've got the number of cells if you're doing a one LiPo cell application. The part numbers that you might use, because your voltage is going to range between 3.6 and 4.2, any of these 25-volt parts would be perfectly adequate and then you just pick it based on the current. Do you have a 300 amp solution? There's the first part number, 300 for the second. If you're only running 100 amps, maybe the third one. And it goes down the table then, depending on the number of cells you're looking. One, three, four, five, seven, ten cells. Look across, find the current, the power, and there's the part number that you should start looking at for your design. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Tom. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Well, thank you, Amelia. Had a good time and hope you've learned a little bit on how to drive a MOSFET for a battery-powered motor application. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about MOSFETs for motor control from Nexperia. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talk section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash EE Journal. <laughs>